unified layer for logs, metrics, and traces. Like six, seven years ago, we started teaching how to do a unified logging layer, right? That's how, well, maybe 10 years ago, how do we started in this journey. And one of the challenges is like, when you're dealing with telemetry data, how it's called today, right? It's really hard to concentrate and handle the volume, even more when data comes from different sources and uh, destinations. First of all, I would like to know who are your first timers using FluentBet or FluentD. Maybe you can raise your hand so I can get an idea. Oh, just a few ones. So I'm going to get more back reports or, or similar things. So I assume that most of you have some knowledge about what FluentBet does. But first of all, it's good to clarify where we came from. You know, CNCF has projects. It's a neutral place for all the projects around cloud native space, it started for Kubernetes, Prometheus, Jaeger, and so on. FluentD, our parent project, was graduated around 2019, if I'm not wrong, and FluentBit is part of that journey. Both projects are graduated, and while others are still, you know, in this phase of incubation, we are expecting to also get OpenTelemetry um, graduated at the end of the year. So it's really interesting to see how the projects evolve from one stage to the other. And what is really important is adoption. It's adoption not just because somebody's using it, it's because they are using it, they are reporting issues, and there are people contributing back to the project, which at the end of the day is more important. You don't want to deploy something that nobody is going to maintain it over time. You want to deploy something like this and forget about it, right? And when you get security issues, somebody will <laughs> issue a fix. But at the end of the day, um, what is important is that this is a very vendor-neutral place. Despite their company like us from Chronosphere Calyptia or Amazon using these projects, developing code, you will make sure that whatever you have here will be there for many, many years. So let's get started with logs, metrics, and traces. Uh, in a nutshell, Flow and Bit, uh, as an agent, as you might know, can handle all of the telemetry types of data. And to be honest, it was not designed for that. It was designed for logs. But the way, and this was luck, the way that we designed how to handle logs was in a very agnostic way. We don't care how the data looks like. We're going to serialize it and provide some processing and be able to ship it out to any type of backend storage. And that's how FluentBit was evolving from handling just logs to metrics and now traces at the same time. What is, uh, we talk about metrics support, we're fu fully compatible with open metrics and open telemetry. Also, for example, if you have Prometheus services exposing metrics, you can use FluentBit to scrape those metrics. Also, FluentBit itself generates metrics, and you can send them as, or expose them as Prometheus exporter, or you can send them over remote write. And also, that's not enough. We can send that metrics to Splunk, so we know how to format metrics to Splunk, and same to InfluxDB and other formats around. And when you want to do metrics with the Prometheus uh, world, so as I said, it's not just also how to you can collect metrics, but also FluentBit can, well, collect remotely, I mean, can also get them from the host file system that you are running in. That means, are you using Node Exporter? By the way, in your systems from Prometheus? OK, some years ago, and I think that this idea came from Europe. We always get really good ideas from here, from this, from this version of KubeCon. I don't know why, but they told us, hey, I have not exported from Prometheus, and I'm using FluentBit. So is there a way that in FluentBit we can replicate the functionality of not exporter? Meaning, like, generate the metrics from the host? Yeah, because we're reading profile system, we're doing a bunch of stuff. So we ended up replicating the functionality. So today, if you're running Node Exporter and you have FluentBit, you can use FluentBit to replace Node Exporter because we have a plugin that copy pastes the same metrics, same levels, dimensions, everything. And Node Exporter works in our version supports for Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. Yes, Windows is, is everywhere. And destinations for the Prometheus world, well, we support the two primary formats. In OpenTelemetry, side, as an agent, we support OTLP in the input, OTLP in the output. What that means? We are OpenTelemetry compatible. 
So that means that in this journey where now you might thinking or instrumenting your applications to move to open telemetry because it's a standard that all of us will believe in that will solve many problems and also for the vendors, so you can trust that Fluembit is having one of the best implementations also with the open telemetry tools that they are providing in the input and in the output. So with Fluembit, if you are a user, you understand that you can collect data from many sources many destinations. Maybe some of you are just using it in Kubernetes, but in the story, Fluentbit was originally designed to collect metrics from embedded Linux devices. That means that it was designed to be very lightweight, to use a lo uh, very low CPU, very low memory. Somehow ended up being used in containers like crazy. Right? And when I say this, it's important because before Kubernetes, everybody was running VMs, bare metal machines, and we have collectors for systemd, for files to receive data over TCP, UDP. Many people collect syslog messages from firewalls by using Fluembit outside of Kubernetes. So I just wanted to give you um, a bit of context. And the Fluent ecosystem, as I said, it not tries to be a drop-in replacement. Actually, if you go to talk to any company, that has any product, everything, they will say, hey, replace A with B. This is better because X, Y, Z, right? But in reality, in technology, and if you look at your production environments, you will notice that you don't have just one type of application that you need to replace. In our space, observability, you have logs, metrics, and traces, plus syslog, plus messages from systemd, plus X, Y, Z. And you need a unified way to collect this information because your goal is to do data analysis. If you cannot have something that can be kind of plug and play to receive this information, it will be a, will be a mess. So uh, in the Fluent ecosystem, we always, that's what is called Fluent, right? And actually, uh, the principal project, it was called Fluent D because a Fluent name was taken. So everything, I don't know if you remember, everything was MySQL D or something D for services. That was is Fluent D. But the organization name is Fluent because it was time to be fluent in talking to protocols, fluent to integrating with other projects, even competitors. And pretty much you can create what is called telemetry pipelines. As I said, one family, one origin, and both are graduated projects. And the problem that we solve is pretty much this. We fit in the middle. We connect multiple sources to multiple destinations, and we are able to adapt to every single use case from embedded Linux use cases to bare metal machines in the cloud, as Google, Amazon, and others use. And the way to deploy this agent is that you just sit it on the VM, in your container, in the bare metal, in, and I think that there are some experiments, of, if I'm not wrong, as a serverless. So Fluentbit is a C program, a C language program, it starts really fast so you don't, get, you don't have any delays, so it, which is a really good um, solution for something that needs to compute data pretty fast in a, in a matter of less than one second. And when you collect data, you can not only send the data to one destination. We support routing, we support buffering. If something goes wrong, the data can be retrieved from that safe place that is called the buffer, the file system buffer, and you can send data to multiple locations if that is desired. But also, at some point, you would like to do some, what we call in our world, aggregation. Sometimes it's called now collection, right? But Fluentbit can be deployed as an aggregator or what is to be called as a forwarder on the edge or a processor in the edge. So what that means, and when you're going to try to do something like this, imagine that, uh, do we have Elastic users? Elastic search users? Okay. Please don't blame on me, but if we look at Elasticsearch three years ago, and you have like a few hundred nodes sending data to Elastic, what happens? Boom. The JVM explodes because it cannot handle the load, right? Well, it can handle, but it takes time because also it's doing indexing and many things behind the scenes. And one way to solve those problems was to put something that controls the data flow in the middle. So you will find that in the past, many Elastic users were using even Logstash or FluentD in the middle, same as this, in order to control the data that is being flowed from uh, the edge or from the agents. 
And same as can be used with FluentBit, you can receive data from OpenTelemetry, or you can scrape metrics from Prometheus, and then send that to your own destination. And I'm going to do a really quick recap on how Fluent works in the Kubernetes logging world. So, you know, Kubernetes is just a group of computers, right? A cluster, right? And you have two primary roles. One is called the, the master server or API server, and then you have nodes. A node's pretty much a physical or a VM machine that runs the operating system instance. And when you deploy an application, you deploy what's called a pod. A pod runs a container. And the way that logging works in Kubernetes, in most of the application and kind of best practices, it says, make your application write any type of logging message to standard output interface or standard error. What happened next is that the container engine, when it's running, and it has is piping these uh, interfaces and receive those messages that are being generated, it writes them back to the file system. Yeah, maybe you can bypass the file system and use a network driver, but normally what it does, it's writing the messages. And there's a typo because it says Apache is writing Nginx. I just noticed that, but we will fix it. So every container has its own container log. But that is not enough, right? So when the data gets written to the, to the file, the file gets encoded inside a JSON message because it has some metadata from the container agent that, that is the stream where it comes from and also at the date or the time where this data was generated. And it looks, this looks okay, it's cool, but also our message gets encapsulated in JSON and it gets escaped because JSON say you have to escape your messages. But that is not all. When you deploy an application, you don't want to say, oh, show me your logs from Nginx, from Apache. You might have a thousand, but the way that you deploy this thing is like you say, I'm going to set labels, I'm going to add some context to this pod that is running. And those are labels and annotations. But that information does not live where the application is running. It lives in the API server, in the master server. So if you want to do logging, you have to take data from two places, make them one, and then you will be able to ship it. So something like this, that is a simple message, at the end of the day, gets expanded with a lot of metadata like this. So yeah, logging is really expensive. You might imagine that writing this to this, reading from this, decoding, encoding, is really expensive. In, in our world in Fluent, we try to do as more cash as possible, right, for, and reduce the number of API calls to API server, but also we can talk to Kubelet that if you're familiar with the architecture, Kubelet runs on every single node, so, and that has a copy of the metadata, so you can optimize. Just a tip in case you have access to the API of Kubelet, yeah, you can point Fluentbit to Kubelet to avoid the, you know, all your nodes talking to the API server. Now I'm going to introduce you a, a new concept that we recently were talking about, about filters and processors. As you know, historically, what filters does in Fluentbit is like, imagine that you have a pipeline, and that pipeline goes from left to right. In the left, you have all the source where you're reading the information that is coming from your files over the network. But after that, you have one phase that is called filtering, because maybe you want to drop data, you want to enrich data, meaning like you want to add some keys, remove some stuff, and then you have the output, meaning like a way to decode that information and send it out. What you have here in the screen is the architecture of the current Fluent Bit version on how do they work with filters. Imagine that you have thread one, which is a principal thread, that is the main event loop. What is doing buffering, scheduling, handling retries if something goes wrong, but also run filters. Meaning like if thread two, which is on the left, read information somewhere, encode events for the main event loop, it gets buffered, it gets buffered, then gets filtered, if there's any filtering, and then it's passed to the other thread, which does only handle destinations. Handle destination means get the data, decode the event, format the data to the expected backend, and try to deliver. And I say try to deliver because 
things fail. And when it fails, you have to retry. And if you cannot retry, you have to delete. You have to release the space. And this sounds, oh, yeah, it makes sense. This is a new ver so the current version from one year and a half ago, because we used to have only have one single thread. Fluent bit was single thread with asynchronous I/O and just one event loop. Now we have three event loops for per thread, and we have different mechanisms uh, around. Do you see any problem here, or potential problem? Yeah, it works. Now, what about this? Who can tell me what will happen here? Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> this is what we had before. We were not doing nothing, not much filtering, but now we have more filters. And the truth is that we have found users and customers who are running 15 to 20 filters. Insane. I want this, like kids with a candy. I want that, 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 that. Awesome. At the end of the day, you had too much sugar in the body, right? And the same happens here. When one thread is ingesting data and data is being filtered, that's delaying things. As you can see, the main event loop, what it does, buffering, scale, and red tries. But what is the priority now? If you add more filters, you are adding more computing time and you are overloading the main thread. That means that you're not able to ship data fast enough, you're not able to read more because you need a space for that. You don't want to blow up memory. We don't want to be a JVM or Logstash. So this is what happens, contention. Meaning we are sending data, but we have to wait until the whole filters finish so we can continue operating. And this has been a problem, but a recent problem from the last eight months. Because before that, this architecture was pretty fine. Everybody was processing, I don't know, 40,000 messages per second, 50,000. But now we are in 2024. Workloads are increasing, and you will notice that in your environment. And this is what happened. You have more filters, and we are not able to process the data fast enough, and the things get messy. And you get contention. And the solution for this has been processors. Processor is a new interface we just shipped a few months ago that has a really interesting value. It's the, as a concept, processors are a single chain of processing units. Processors can work over different telemetry types. For example, they are processor for logs, for metrics, and for traces. They can run in a separate thread and process, well, can do pretty much whatever you were able to do with filters. And this is the way how it works. Yeah, we give the problem to the other thread, right? But he's the guilty, right? If the user is trying to process more data on that thread, that's fine. But we are not blocking the main thread. Now, you might imagine, OK, oh, I'm using filters, so I should not use them anymore. Uh, no, actually, you can run filters as processors today. We made it in a way that we didn't want to break compatibility, right? So all the filters that you have for, to modify to the Kubernetes filter or there's some Amazon filters to enrich your metadata with the instance information can run as processors. And I'm going to run an, a typical FAQ that, in, and these questions come from this week at KubeCon. Because I had two, three weeks here, two, three questions here, and that people was continuously asking, asking, asking. What is? Why should I use FluentD? When should I use FluentBit? And I wanted to give us just a simple, simple summary of FluentD. It's written in Ruby language, which it works fine, but it's a single thread. It can scale until certain level, right? FluentBit is written in C, and the difference that. Fluentbit has been designed in the latest years to be a multi-thread program, so nobody, lo nobody longer has one CPU in his computer, right, or her computer. Even your phone is running more than one core, right? So why are we going to just use one? 
And we always keep the same philosophy to run with very low CPU and memory footprint. The other is that when you think about extending your pipeline, because everybody at scale wants to bring the business logic into the pipeline, they say, oh, I need a new plugin, a new, a new way to, to add my own behavior to the pipeline. In FluentD, you have to do it with Ruby, but in FluentB, you can write it in C. Yeah, people don't like it, I get it. Uh, but you know, now you can do it in Wasm. So you can do it in Python, you can write it in Rust, you can write input and output plugins in Golang, or you can do Lua scripting. If you are familiar with Lua or Nginx scripting, that is Lua, so it will be something really simple that you can add to your config maps to add your own logic into the pipeline. And when operating with other ecosystem, as I say again, I want to be very clear on this, we try to integrate the best way possible and give the best solution available in the market for every single user. Every Fluent bit has been used everywhere. So that means that wherever you go with any type of protocol implementation, we should be able to solve the problem on that ecosystem. And the question was, oh, can I use OpenTelemetry? How this overlap? OpenTelemetry is a protocol, OpenTelemetry is a specification. But also we have SDKs you know, to instrument your application that they are able to ship telemetry data, right? Now, as you can see here, the overlap that exists is with the open telemetry collector, not with open telemetry. That, that is a, a big difference. But that is fine. I think that is good that the user must have choices for different use cases. Hotel collector is really good, for example, for, for tracing, for sampling. And they are getting into there with other features for metrics and logs. We're really good at logs. We're getting into metrics. Yeah, and we are new on traces. Yes, this adds some confusion. Where should we get started? But always my suggestion is use what works for you and will work over time. And I think that uh, I like to do that emphasis. And same as you can receive from one to one, yes, you can use flow embed as a main aggregator or collector for all your telemetry type of data. Not just open telemetry, but for everything that you have. And as of today, we are 13 billion downloads. And this is insane. Uh, maybe I say the same thing every year because I'm amazed. Um, at KubeCon Amsterdam last year, we were 6.3 billion, right? So now we are 2x of that. That means it's not because, I personally think it's not because uh, the project is, oh, it's so great, we're going to deploy thousands. It's like, hey, people is moving to Kubernetes. People is, I don't know, using more cluster, the adoption is growing on the CNCF ecosystem, and now they need an agent to manage logs by default. And it's flowing bit, and that's why, and we are really thankful for our users. And this week, we released Fluent Bit version three. So, a few things. So, every time that we do a major release, and actually the last major release has been here at KubeCon Europe, and Somehow, we like that stuff. We do a new T-shirt, a new design. We try to give these T-shirts for everybody. Um, but next time, I will owe you one, uh, as I explained to you before. But let me tell you about what is new. So first of all, Fluentbit has it's a small team, right? Um, at least from our company, Caliptia, now Stronosphere. Uh, we are like four or five developers, right? Uh, Leonardo wrote, one of the, our maintainers, wrote the HTTP2 support for Fluentbit. So thanks so much for that. What that means, that now if you rely on any type of instrumentation or collect, collect data from application that wants to use HTTP v2, now you can do it. There's no big change from the user's perspective but you will notice that you will be more performant because with HTTP v2 was made for concurrency, something that didn't exist for HTTP v1. Also, we get other internal changes on how to manage the data cellularization that I'm going to talk to you in a few minutes. Also, when thinking how to modify the data, because users always want to modify the data because of business needs, we said, okay, we have a bunch of filters, modify, uh, modifier, grep, I don't know, we have like 20 or more. And we say, hey, most of them are kind of overlapping in functionality, are doing pretty much similar things. So we are chipping today 
one more <laughs> to just try to reduce the complexity that is called content modifier. But of course, this is a processor, not a filter. The good thing about this processor is that it operates on top of logs and traces. For logs, it operates on top of metadata or attributes plus the body content, and in traces, of course, on top of the spans. And the operations are supported, insert, absurd, delete, rename, hash, extract, and, and so on. Somebody asked me this week, hey, why do you have a hash function? And in the product that we offered also, we got the same question, why you, you need to hash? There's many use cases where, even, even in Europe with GDPR, you are collecting information, but you're not able to send all the information in plain if you have sensitive data. For example, social security number, user password, but you have to send the key and some value. Hash works for that. Of course, the idea of hashing is like it cannot be a reverse process, and so on. And the next one is a metric selector. As I told you, Fluembed can extract in a metrics, it can receive metrics over the network, but at some point, you would like to exclude certain metrics that you are not interested in. Why you're going to send everything to Prometheus or everything to your metrics backend? You don't need all of that. So the metric selector allows you to filter, to include or exclude certain metrics by its name and shortly by labels. That means that it could be really easy to, to manage. And the last processor that we implemented before in this release is a SQL processor. You will say, oh, why SQL? Are you using SQL Lite or MySQL on it? No. The thing is that we found that what users want to do with data is basically sometimes select certain keys and sometimes are thinking about expressions in their mind. Hey, I just want to all the data that this value is greater than 10, and that's it. And our option that we have available before was to, hey, write a Lua script for that. Uh, I don't know Lua, I don't have time. Or maybe you can use some filters, and this person waits five to six hours, right, or more. So we said, okay, why we don't implement a SQL processor? We used to have a stream processor in Fluembit. It's still there, but it works different, and it has its own issues at scale. So we said, hey, let's implement a new, a new SQL processor that allows to select for logs primary specific keys, rename them, and put conditionals on it. So with this new SQL processor, you can do that. And now I know this question is coming. Oh, does it support aggregation, like count, max, mean, group by? Yes, that will be available in two weeks. Not today, in two weeks. So yeah, this is a new SQL processor. And one other part of the news is like, when you're thinking on open telemetry, for example, in the ideal case of this, this works perfect, but what happens in reality, if you go to production environments, is like on the left, you don't have open telemetry. You have syslog, you have UDP, you have TCP, and any kind of web protocol that you can imagine. And the structure of that data, it was not meant to follow an open telemetry schema. But you need that as an open telemetry schema. So one of the important updates in our open telemetry output connector is that allows you to customize in a very granular way the message that's going to be sent as open telemetry format. For example, you are getting a log message, though you have five keys, but you know that two of them conceptually or logically are metadata or attributes, and you want to represent that in open telemetry. Hey, these two keys are metadata, everything else is part of the body content. So now you have that type of control. And before ending, I wanted to show you um, a little example of how this works in the new processors, content modified. Can you read the screen or it's too small? Oh, you need glasses like me. Now it's better? Yes, okay. This is my shit sheet here. Don't take a look at that. Those are comments. So we have here, um, we, yeah, if you're looking at this, you are not familiar. We shipped a new YAML format some months ago. So the classic configuration mode of Fluentbit works, but also we have a YAML compatible version. 
Okay, we encourage everybody to switch to YAML because there's more tooling for validation. Okay, so we have defined a pipeline here, and now we have defined the input plugins or the inputs sources where the data will be received or generated from. The first plugin that I'm loading is called Dummy. Dummy, what it does, it just sends the same message over and over because we are doing a test, and just to explain the concept, we're going to generate a JSON message like this, that it has one, two, three, four keys with different values. Key one, key two, message, and HTTP URL. And then we have attached a new processor. As you can see, the processor is under the plugin. Now, you cannot use processors in classic mode. If you're using the other version of Fluent Bay, you're using classic mode, you cannot use processors, okay? And we want that everybody moves to YAML, that's why. So, yeah, we have to force the user somehow, all right? And, well, here we're loading the, the content modifier processor, and the action that we are taking is going to insert a new key on the record, right? The key name, the key value. And what we're doing is to send this information to the standard output. I'm going to run this locally in my terminal, so I'm not running Kubernetes, nothing fancy here. Very basic. Um, mm -hmm. Can you see it? Dun, dun, dun. Let me see if this doesn't break here. Yeah. As you can see, every second it's printing the same message, but you will see that at the end there's a new key, and that key is called new key, new value. And let me help you here. Maybe you, you can use JQ. This is really good for debugging, so you can learn something about how to debug this stuff. So there you can see that a new key is being generated. Okay, it's not a big deal. But internally, this new processor, I don't know if you remember that I mentioned that we have a new serialization, not serialization format, a new way to work with, um, with the API. Right here, new internal API for data manipulation. This new processor is using that, which is a new mechanism, a more performant to perform all these modifications on the records, okay? Now, okay, and for example, imagine that now we want to hash message. Well, it's a value new, but anyways, you can hash it. I'm going to break, I'm going to start again. Let me close this one. As you can see, the message now value has been hashed. And now we can do something more interesting. We can, we can ex operate what is called, in an action that is called extract. Sometimes you have data that in your mind means something. You know that some, if, you, if you read an address, you will see, oh, this is a protocol, this is a domain, this is a subdirectory or path. And sometimes you need that information to be extracted on different ways. You used to write a Lua script for that, or run a filter, or a regular expression, but now this processor supports that. And that means that you're going, what we're going to do right now is to extract the value of that key by using this regular expression. If you don't like regex, that's fine, nobody likes it. And, but there, the good thing is that here you can have the group names and the values will be assigned automatically. So the goal is to just get this, this key and expand its value as a key value pair. So let me save this one. Let's go again. And now you will see that we have, oh, let me stop it so you can read. And now you can see that we have the HTTP URL has been split, split oh, new key, well, this is an order matter, has been split in four new uh, keys, HTTP protocol, HTTP domain, HTTP path, whatever. Everybody who's using Splunk or Elastic sometimes is running these queries when the data has been ingested. The value here is that you can do it before. And what, what is the gain with that? It's not the same running a query when you have ingested thousands of thousands of messages than doing this processing in parallel while the data is being collected and ingested. And the CPU cycles are very, very low. So we are always encouraging, and also seeing some users, that all these analytics queries or processing are moving from the left now, sorry, from the right to the left. They're really interesting. And 
Finally, if you don't want, for example, in this example, this key that was just extracted, you just run a new action and you just delete it. So you can play with logs like with anything, right? It's pretty simple. And let's talk about SQL, the new SQL processor. Now we have a small version, right, of the same, uh, well, it's a small version of the same, the same dummy message where we have a key, we have the HTTP address, and we're going to do first is to enable the processor, and we're going to extract that key as a multiple key value pairs. But as a, what our boss asked that, hey, give me a list of all domains that I'm being scraped. I don't care about anything else. Well, at the end of the day, it could be IP addresses or anything that's more useful than just the domain. So we're going to do it in one round. So the first processor is going to extract right, the message, and the second is what is it going to do? It's going to select the new key that does not exist key here, but we can, oh, this is a typo, we can, okay, key one, we're going to select key one, but I'm going to rename it as key, and then we are going to select HTTP domain from stream. From stream means like it's coming from here. We don't have tables, everything happens in memory, okay? And then we're just going to switch the example. And there you go. So every one second is triggering a, a new message. So this is how you can extract messages. You can mix content modifier, run in a SQL query. And of course, uh, and, and today we got the first question, hey, is it possible to run SQL over metrics? I was like, uh, not yet, but that's interesting. And then we were thinking like, hey, Fluent Bit ship internal metrics. Will be good to provide a SQL interface for the internal metrics. Interesting, so there are many things that can be done here. And lastly, maybe I can show you the node exported metrics. So I have um, one VM that is running here. It's a Linux VM. And I'm going to run Fluent Bit from the command line. So when you run a uh, Fluent Bit, and you put minus H, you will get a ton of information around uh, the input plugins that are built in. Everything is built in. You can have external plugins, but by default we ship a ton of good things. Then you have the processors available. Oh, we have a labels processor to play with labels. And then we got filters. They look old, but that's fine. They can be run as processors. And then the output connector for Azure, Oracle, Google, Forward, HTTP endpoints, whatever you can think. So we're going to run what is called the node exporter metrics. I'm doing it on Linux because we have more metrics collector on Linux than on Mac OS. Yeah, and I'm going to just, um, oh, we can expose it to, okay, let's send it to Prometheus. Exported. Let me see if I'm not wrong. Oops, I put something wrong. Read permissions from. Oh, I, didn't, I should not. Oh, it's a thermal zone. Okay, so we are running the Prometheus exported on 2021. What that means? Flowing bit right now, it's gathering metrics from the file system and it's putting in a buffer into the Prometheus exporter uh, metrics. So if you do curl HTTP uh -huh, 2021, and you put metrics, I just did a scrape of the metrics that Fluentbit is exporting. That means that Fluentbit can behave as a Prometheus exporter. Okay? And if you can start seeing something similar like, uh, I'm going to send this to the exporter, but also I'm going to send the data to STD out, so I'm going to see the data on both sides. I'm going to get a match rule. You will start seeing that on one side, the data is being generated. Now it's generated, oh, the buffer is ready. So from one side, we are sending the metrics to standard output, while on the right, we're just querying this um, by using curl. This is a simple concept of how you can integrate uh, the things 
around telemetry, playing with logs and metrics. Um, so I owe you the traces example because we just ran out of time. But anyways, um, I would like to invite you to sign it up for the book, for the webinar, and give some space for questions. Thank you. Just raise your hand. Please. If we, the question is, if we support our own logs as JSON, yeah, internally in Fluentbit, we don't, we don't do JSON. We do message pack, which is a binary version of JSON. But if we can ship our own logs as JSON, no. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it sounds like, yeah, we don't do it. Most of people don't need it, but if you are interested in that, into that, please open a GitHub issue, and we will be happy to support. Well, if you have more questions, uh, we will, oh, I have a more question here. Oh, you want to know about the architecture? Oh, he's asking if we can go back and see the comparison of that. Yeah. Okay, I didn't get the last part. Sorry. Why do you stick to just three threads for this instead of, for instance, having a work pool for the filters? And so I was kind of wondering, where does the coroutine sit into those three threads? Oh, where the coroutines, yeah, I mentioned that. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, for the background. So we're going to go more technical. Yeah, Fluentbit, uh, when it was created, it was a single process, right? A single thread. And in order to process data and without blocking, Right? You have to do something with the operating system. For example, when you are doing computing or doing something, there are always two contexts in the process, right? There's user space and there's kernel space. And sometimes through system calls, you want to achieve certain things. For example, I ask the kernel, hey, give me a socket, connect to this endpoint. But while I'm connecting or doing a DNS lookup, I send a DNS request. I need to wait for the response. That will take some time. And coroutines help us to say, hey, you know what? You have an event loop. A coroutine is like a lightweight thread where it says, we have an API for that, that says, OK, I'm going to do a DNS lookup, and I'm going to suspend. While I'm suspended, the event loop was still working, scheduling, reading data. And at some point, the kernel is going to signal back the event loop and says, hey, you got a response. You are ready. And that coroutine, that context, now can resume and continue operating. OK? This was when uh, we had a single thread. Now, in the model that you see in the screen, now we use coroutines in the output. So every output thread that you see can spawn 1,000 threads. Sorry, 1,000 coroutines. And everything looks really uh, smooth. Let me check if I have. Um, Let's take a look at the code. Yeah, if you are here, it's because you have time, right? <laughs> OK, yeah, so, but let me jump into this, because uh, we won't get it online. So this is the HTTP output plugin. This is called the, OK, pretty quickly. OK, plugins register with a structure. We define callbacks when the plugin gets initialized, when the plugin exits, and when the plugin is going needs to flash information. OK, the plugin doesn't manage any, any logic. It tries to get the data, process, and deliver. So if we go to the flash callback, oops, oh, oops, uh, let me check this. There you go, flash callback. Let's focus on this important part. Oh, I, I, I choose the, the more complex plugin for this. Sorry about that. 
This has changed so much. Okay, we have a function that is called HTTP post that is here. Okay, take a look at this call. It says FLB, which is a prefix for Fluentbit API, upstream, upstream context get. You know what does behind the scenes? It does a DNS lookup. When it knows the IP, it performs a TCP connection. And if it's a SSL connection, it will do all the TLS handshake. And once it's ready, it will return here. But imagine that the remote endpoint takes five seconds to respond. The program doesn't block. It runs under a coroutine. The flash callback under a coroutine, it just send the request, wait for the kernel, for all the steps that it needs, while Fluentbit keeps working, or that output thread that we have keeps operating in other coroutines. I don't know if you remember, if you are old enough as me, when you were running Windows 95 or Windows 3.11, you used to have one CPU core. And how was possible that I can move the, C the mouse, click, and open Windows? They are running some kind of lightweight threads. You have one CPU core, how that's possible, because what you're doing is so, ra, ra, doing a micro-execution of code under a very small single unit of time. And with coroutine and the scheduler and the event loop, we do the same. I don't know if I answered your question, but no? <laughs> OK, sorry about that. Hi. Uh, so uh, when, when we using processor to hash some GDPR data, uh, can we hash it with some uh, our provision key to decrypt in some cases like legal, legal requests, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in our backend for future? Today we support SHA-256, and it's not it's hard coded, but if there's any good use case to say I would like to choose my my hashing function. Since we use OpenSSL, we have you know, a bunch of them to choose from. Yeah, it would be great to know what would be the use cases. Just open a GitHub issue, we can implement it. OK, to provide some custom private key. Or to sign the messages. Uh, to decrypt it uh, for some legal requests. OK, so what we are doing in, in the hashing algorithms, hashing is not in reverse mode. So it's not encoding. What you're talking about is uh, encoding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Code and be able to decode. So with a GPG, for example. So you want to sign a mess, encode it, sign it, and you know decode. Yeah. yeah, we don't support that at the moment, but it sounds really interesting. And just open a GitHub issue. OK, thanks. Thank you. If I can do manipulation with Watson plugins? Uh, yes, but you might have to implement like a filter that does that custom hashing. You can do it in Lua too. Uh, yeah, Lua runs, same. Lua originally is a filter, but can run as a processor because they are compatible. Yeah, you just write a function that takes a value, apply, sign it with a key, import your Lua packages, and hi. Um, thanks for the presentation. Is there a plan to add a Microsoft Sentinel output, just like we have for Splunk, for example? Um, it's possible. Yes. Um, you might open a request on, on GitHub, but it looks very enterprise use case. So I don't know if the product side has something about it, but um, yeah, I, I never use it. So I will not say, yeah, we'll be ready in two weeks. No, it's not like that. Maybe you can open a GitHub issue. The way that it works is like, most of the stuff that exists today in Fluentbit has been because users feedback. And sometimes users don't get it, but it's real. You open a GitHub issue and you get, a lot of people saying, hey, this is interesting for me for X, Y, Z. I will need to use it for these reasons. It's a better way to, for us to prioritize it as a project. Thank you. Thank you. And when you say uh, it, it was first single-threaded, do you refer to Fluentbit 1.x? Uh, I think until 1.x, yeah. I think that after 2, we introduced the threading, but in a very optional way. 
Now, most of plugins are by default running a separate thread. So every output plugin that you, that you create in the configuration automatically runs in a separate thread. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hello. Um, as it is a new major version, are there breaking change for the actual config in previous version? There's no breaking changes on configuration on this new version. OK, thanks. OK. OK, thank you so much, everybody. I hope you thank have you. a safe return to home. One.